Where is that? I suppose that should actually talk to the camera. Yeah. Well, Here we go. We are live. We're getting some wicked glitter off of this thing. That's a, there's a lot of weight. I'm going to do a little close up here. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's Whoa, that's better. That's nice. So you can adjust these lights too. Uh, it's probably these. These ones are really. Mm, I think it's probably this one angled on it directly. So we might want to just angle those away just a tad, only because it's creating a, a really big reflection on this. And it's not like I don't have plenty of light. Yeah. So I think that's going to be better. Uh, anyway, we can, always move, we can always move the camera if we need to. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, what I decided to do for this demo, for those who are watching, uh, Jimmy, you can tell me who's online watching, uh, or at least maybe it just lists viewers and not individuals. Yeah, let's say say hi, say hi to Monty, and we can see uh, see your names here, folks. I'm going to share this out yeah. uh, to everyone on Facebook so we can get some more viewers here. So what I decided to do was I thought it was appropriate since you know this is we're, we're sworn to the black here. Uh, to do a black canvas, this is a black gesso canvas, 18 by 24, and uh, so I just drew up kind of a, a, a head and bust, and I showed a couple of shots of it where I just, you can see the, the colored pencil just lightly sketched in, uh, and then earlier today, I had a little bit of time between one of my sessions, and so I started airbrushing here on the bottom. So here on the camera, you can see some of the airbrush and showing some of the detail. Wow. And then I came in with the black paint there on the tattoo that's on our hand of uh, La Muerta. And so I started edging that back in, and that's what gets rid of the any of the overspray. So you'll see how uh, there's areas that look a little more soft and out of focus. And I don't worry about those too much on the um, in this stage because you'll see how this all tightens up. And so first I have to get down the white and then I'll go to black and then I can come in yet again with the black and you'll see that here on the demo. Uh, and so what I decided to do was I didn't do a lot up here in the hair or the face so that as I'm working on this live with the airbrush here, you guys can see me working and blocking in this area. Um, and again, I'm working in reverse instead of painting shadows, I'm actually painting highlights. So I'll be painting the most in the areas that are going to be the most white and I'll be leaving some of the softer black showing through which would be creating the shadow so it's like working in reverse so if you guys have any questions uh, you can let me know and I can do a quick rundown on uh, how the airbrush works because a, a lot of people don't necessarily know uh, how it works and so you don't hear uh, a uh, a compressor. So far, so far George says uh, looks great, Monty. Oh, thank Joe you. Here saying it looks amazing. Oh, thank okay. you. Perfect. So we need, need to look at the the nozzle here or anything? Or uh, I can show that? you. So this is the airbrush that I use, and uh, this is made by Holbein, the paint company. This is Toracon, and the trigger is here underneath, and so you can see it right here. So this controls this giant needle, which goes to the entire length of the airbrush. And what happens is the compressed air comes up through the hose. As I pull the trigger back, it actually allows the air to escape and come out the front. And inside this cup, when I add some of the liquid paint, uh, it'll create a vacuum. It'll suck the paint from the cup into the body of the airbrush, onto the needle, and then as the needle pulls back out of this little uh, nozzle in the front, it essentially creates a donut. And so uh, what happens is the paint goes on the needle. So if this is the needle that's at the front of the airbrush, and this is the nozzle. As the needle comes back, it creates an aperture for the paint to escape. It comes onto the needle, and then the air rushes by it, and it has nowhere to go on the needle, and so it vaporizes, <clears throat> and it blows off the end of the airbrush. So I have to, to get a pretty tight line and things like that, I have to be um, right up close to the actual canvas, otherwise it'll spread out. So to start this, just so you guys can see, this is just water. But look at the amount of, of volume and stuff that is going through uh, the airbrush. Uh, and I can control all that with that. So you can see that's, that's a fair amount of vapor and product uh, once it's working properly, which is good. It's pretty clean at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, this is basically just good old-fashioned Windex here. And this has a little bit of ammonia in it, and so it's a real good cleaning solution, an agent. Uh, so I can run a little bit of that through. And that's flushing out the airbrush, so we call that flushing or color flushing. So every time I change paint with my airbrush, if I go to black to white to red to blue, then I have to change the paint. 
And sometimes you're getting rid of paint, you're wiping it out of the cup or you're spraying it into a trash can. So um, it might seem like you're wasting paint, but the airbrush is so um, miserly when it comes to the amount of paint that's used. You just use drops, just the teeniest amount. Literally all the paint that you see here that is on that I've airbrushed is probably, I would say six maybe or seven small drops of paint, right? So it's not giant gobs. So if I have a big thing like this, unless I'm doing a, a, a lot of painting on huge projects, something like this would, uh, would probably last me several years because this is, really? yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, because that, that's a lot of paint. And I even have some of these smaller bottles, quite honestly, if it's a color I don't use much, it's the, and the bottles are probably 10 years old. Um, well, so as long as they don't dry out, then you're fine. And the consistency that you want is that of milk. So you don't want it to be more watery than milk. And that might sound weird, but milk still has more density and more volume than just regular water. And so uh, I'm using acrylic paint. Now they call, this particular brand, they call their acrylics ink even though really it's just acrylic paint, but they call theirs things. Um, so this is made by a company that is one of my favorites, Holbein. They also make the airbrush itself. And I have been using their paints for 30 years, off and on, a lot of different products. So although I'm pseudo sponsored by them, they only give me occasional product because I'd already been using it. So it's not like, hey, here, use our stuff and you get free things. It was more like, you're already using our stuff. Thanks for using our products. Here you go, here's some free stuff. Um, you don't have to replace it for the next 20 years. <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to the airbrush, and I might buy one or two airbrushes a year because I like having backups and things like that. You know, an airbrush like this is 200 to 400 bucks. They're not cheap, uh, but uh, it's uh, they, they make their, their money for me, you know, every time I use them. And so um, I might use them for a couple of years, and if I drop them or I prang them or they just get used up, you know, I might just part it out, put it in the parts bin, and then grab a new one. And so... They're almost always out at San Diego Comic-Con. So for the last mm -hmm. five years, I have bought one new one every year out there at, at San Diego. So when you show the first part where you just kind of clean it out, that way, right. is there a deeper cleaning you have to do each time? or Yeah, it... just like uh, taking apart any sort of gun or even spray thing. I can take literally everything apart on this and set all the pieces aside and take out set screws and springs and all that kind of thing. Um, and that would be a deeper cleaning. But uh, for the most part, I can take the needle out, I can wipe it off, make sure, I can see that there's not a lot of paint that's built up or is grabbing onto that needle. And you can see the taper uh, of that needle. I don't know if it's focusing and you can see that or not, but that's, that's a small, tight needle. And that's why, um, you know, this is an illustrator's grade airbrush. You can get a hobby level airbrush for, you know, 40, 50, 60 bucks. It's just not gonna have the level of control and detail that a gun like this will have. Right. Uh, typically, there's a backside on this. I just take it off because I'm always checking the needle and stuff, so I don't use it with that on there. And then, uh, for safety's sake, normally you would have this little nozzle right here, and it would go on the end of this, and it protects the needle from getting pranged or bent. Uh, but because I want to be able to, one, see where the needle is, and because you get tip drying where the paint builds up on the needle, yep. I always paint with the needle exposed so that I can literally very delicately pull off little dried chunks of paint. And so whenever I stop, even if I'm looking at something, I don't even have to think about it. I will unconsciously go over here and I will pull off and make sure there's not any goobers. And that's there, there's no cure for paint tip drying because yep. it's air rushing over paint. It's trying to dry it. Um, and so that's just sort of part of the process. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is the airbrush seems to be working good. So I'm going to take, uh, you know, three or four drops of paint. I'm going to open up my paint thing here. Uh, it's maybe eight or nine drops of paint. And I'll put in just a couple, maybe, this is pretty good paint, doesn't need much, maybe two, three drops of water. And that just helps it stay a little thinner, but I don't want to get any more thin. I back flush it in the cup a little bit. And then a lot of times, either on my hand, or a piece of paper, you know, I'll do a test, make sure it looks like it's going well, or I'll spray it onto just a, a napkin or a piece of paper. And then I'm ready to paint. We have any questions on how airbrushing works yet so far? No, uh, yes, Joker, he's been looking forward to this all night. It's 107 a.m. here. We're oh my gosh, at. where are you at? Uh, yeah, let's know Joker where you're at, and also uh, George, Trivia says we can see just fine, but okay. we want to make sure we get a good 
Yeah, you might you might want to just move over to the to this side. I don't know if you can get that far or not. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, Okay, we'll see. Why don't you start, and we'll see if we can position it. We got our um, yeah. Your your cord may limit you somewhere there. Cord. Yeah. So I'm I'm right-handed, so I'll be on this side. Yeah, I'm gonna make get this laptop mobile. Okay. Yeah, we definitely want to get in and see that. That's... Yeah, I think if you can just get up more into the the face area, then it'll be yeah. See, oh, that, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Frisco. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that'll be better. That way I'm not in the way. You're not watching the back of my head. All right, cool. All right, so what I'm going to do is, is is I start with the areas that I'm putting the highlights in. And so this is going to train my brain to be the opposite of what it normally is. And so what I'll do is, is I'll start here in her cheeks, right? Because this is going to be an area of uh, one of the areas of the most light because uh, it's a forward part of the of the face, and then to create the the cheekbones and the shadow. Now remember, I can do this in many many different layers, so I don't have to worry about too much about overspray and things like that. I'm just starting to sort of build up uh, what we'll call the shape of the face, and so uh, I start leaving the areas of shadow. So her chin's going to be a little bit more of a high area bridge of her nose, of course, the tip, the ball of the nose, all these kinds of things. Um, but I'll also do some airbrushing with the black so that you guys can see that as well. And because it takes a while to build all this up, you'll notice it's, it's quite a bit less than it is in down where her hand and her breasts and stuff are, where it's already had a lot more time spent on it. And you don't need a mask or anything? I don't smell anything, so there's no like, real... You well, if you're doing if you're doing a bigger piece uh, or you're using automotive paints, uh, then yeah, uh, long term an artist should wear a respirator if you're using automotive paints. Um, but I have enough control over this that at the moment there's very very little overspray or or paint rolling back off of this. Uh, but if, if I'm doing a big project and I'm painting a car hood where I'm doing a lot of volume then yeah, I'm gonna wear a respirator, uh, especially since I'm using automotive paints. So even though these paints here are non-toxic, uh, long-term, if you're gonna be doing a lot of airbrushing, you should wear a respirator. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is, is, in the beginning here, especially I just need some of the white of her skin, because of course she's Lady Death. So even though I can airbrush in a shadow on her nose and some of these other uh, things for the moment, I'll just continue to focus on areas that are going to be the high points, the, the, the part here on the face. And sometimes you, you end up with an area that looks weird. So right now I've put more paint in here and it looks like she's got a white mustache. And that's just because there's no white surrounding the area around. So I can just continue to build that up. And again, a lot of it just comes back down to the layers and layers of the uh, the paint. Uh, now, I can also use hand shields. I can use anything to spray against, like a piece of paper. Um, it doesn't even really matter as long as it creates a shape. So, say I'm trying to mask off this hair right here, and I hold any sort of hand shield up next to that, well, now I've got kind of a nice soft line where I have no overspray in there. Now, if I have enough control and I come in and I keep it really tight next to the canvas, I could probably draw that line too and not get the overspray easier. But if you're just starting out and you're and you're learning to airbrush, then you you don't have it, you know, that kind of control. So I've been doing this for 30 years, and so. I have a lot more experience and so uh, the thing that uh, can cause frustration for people who want to learn this or want to do it is is that I, I'm making it look easy <laughs> and it's it's, yes, a, yeah. it's a very difficult uh, art form because I'm not touching the canvas normally when you paint when you draw you're bracing your hand you're bracing your arm and just some of the things that uh, I am monitoring and I'm trying to control is the distance to the canvas, the power of the air, and that's at the tank and the gun, 
the viscosity of the material, right? So I'm also controlling that. I'm controlling the air and the paint here with the trigger. And I'm also controlling my body. I can't brace myself. So all of this is what we would be hand-eye coordination. And you'll notice that I keep my other hand over here and I'm literally bracing. And so I'm making big, big mo motions and movements, long, slow. And every time I stop, notice that I go like this, it stops. So even if my air isn't stopping, you notice how the paint stops, like right there. Mm -hmm. Every time I do a swash like this, I'm literally turning it on and turning it off, turning it on, turning it off. So I literally have calluses and buildup areas on my, on my fingers from uh, the trigger of an airbrush. Because as I come up here like this, I'm actually not praying, spraying paint. I've actually turned it off and there's just air going and not paint. And that's only because uh, I know where the stop start is every single time of this airbrush. And so every one of these little swipes at the end over here and at the end over there, I'm stopping the paint. Because otherwise, if I don't and I stop right there and the paint is still flowing, I'll end up with a, a daub of paint. Because that one pause of stopping and coming back will put more right there at the end. And so every time I'm doing a stroke, I'm, I'm, I'm lofting it away from the canvas and I'm turning it on, I'm turning it off. I'm turning it on, I'm turning it off. Well, and all these techniques uh, work the same way when you do the motorcycles. I need to do a lot mm -hmm. of a motorcycle. Uh, yep, so I painted uh, uh, probably 100 to 200 motorcycles, cars, uh, airplanes, uh, you name it. And um, it's just a different kind of paint. And the urethane paints are, um, they're very smelly. And they're, they're kind of toxic. They're not as bad as they were in the 70s when they had a ton of um, uh, just lead and all sorts of garbage and stuff in them. Uh, and so the, the paints are certainly better today, but they're still not healthy. And so when I work with the automotive paints, I have to work in a separate studio that's out of my garage. I took a one, one bay of the garage and I closed it all off. And so I have a totally separate studio. So if you guys have watched any of my live videos from the studio, a lot of times they're in the, that outer studio where I do a lot of the big Western artwork. And um, that's where I work late at night or on any of the really big projects. Like I've had airplane cowls and whole vehicles and stuff in there. Uh, I recently did a, a, a big Ford project that was... Um, uh, uh, with the names escaping not raptor <laughs> but um uh anyway it's on it's on my facebook page and i had the whole vehicle in the garage next door to me and then i was painting the hood and the tailgate where people can find that on uh facebook when you do that from your uh, your home studio or your uh, uh, studio studio yeah and if you want to see any of the vehicles you can either just go to maverick custom paint on facebook there's a separate page for it or you can go to the website maverick custom paint and you can see uh, almost uh, all the, the paint jobs that I've done over the years. And a lot of times if I do want a project now, I'll share it over to that page, even though I'm not really marketing myself to that anymore. Uh, I was doing motorcycles, uh, which I love motorcycles. I ride and I collect uh, bikes as well. I do have a love for them. But um, the uh, at the time, I didn't have a whole lot of work in comics. And so... Uh, I decided to do a lot more work in uh, motorcycles. And then when that uh, sort of industry took a, a giant crapper uh, in the, uh, when the recession hit, you know, people weren't, you know, spending thousands of dollars on their paint jobs or they, you know, maybe they already owned their Harley and stuff like that. So right now I'm just flushing the, uh, the color out. And I think what I'll do so we can show some uh, work with uh, black instead of just all white is even though we know her face doesn't look great at the moment, it's kind of looking clownish. It's just because it's in the middle section of what we're doing. And so as an artist, you just have to have faith in the ability of what you're doing that, you know, the overall tightness of the look that we're going for is more like what you're seeing here on the La Muerta tattoo. See, you so, uh, a couple comments here for you. Ace says, I just bought a Monty Remark. Oh, Very cool. Awesome. Uh, what kind of compressor and how much air pressure do you use when you're painting? Um, so I'm not actually, the reason why you can't hear a compressor going is I'm using an air tank. And I don't know if you want to angle this down yeah. to see it, but it looks like a scuba diving tank and it has yeah. CO2 in it. 
And it's a pretty affordable way to get into it. And if you, you know, don't want to have a compressor, uh, you know, going in the middle of the night or rattling around, or sometimes they smell like oil for, I think about 150 bucks, you buy the tank. Once you own it, it's only $15 to refill it. So what you're doing is you're just getting the nozzle set up up here and then you're connecting your air hose to it. So now I have a perfectly quiet and safe and it's pretty reasonable to refill again, 10 bucks, yeah. 15 bucks at a welding supply store. And this will last me for many, many projects uh, for many hours. And so um, I usually typically pressure wise, I should be at about 22 right now. Uh, it looks like it's a little low at the moment. I'm going to turn it up just a hair. Um, so I find that 22 is, is great. I used to work at about 30 because that's what I was always told and that's PSI. And then I sort of realized, wow, I, you know, I never really experimented on my own. I only ever listened to other people. And then I found that for me and the delicate work I like to do, it seemed a bit high. So uh, this would be easier to see. So here on the napkin, you can kind of see as I get really close, I should be able to get literally pencil thin lines all the way to wham, you know, with just the difference in the trigger and then all the way down to, you know, hopefully the, the smallest line that I can get. And I have to get real close to the canvas to be able to pull that off. You're almost dragging the needle on the canvas, which yeah. I have done before because you can't give it any space or time to spread out. You got to be really close to draw with it. So what I'm going to do, since I've already done some of the nice delicate line work here on the La Muerta tattoo, what I thought would be cool is to come in with the black and then just start shading back with it a little bit. And so now I can start creating these sort of layers of subtlety uh, in her tattoo, in the rose. And again, I can come back with layer upon layer upon layer of uh, blacks and whites until I get a pretty high... Uh, realism kind of look. So even in this little rose area where I just put a little bit of the black in there, now that petal is starting to, to curve and turn out towards the viewer. And so even if you don't have the kind of control that I do with the airbrush, you can use these techniques like I was talking about with the uh, masking and shielding and things like that. And if you get overspray or an area uh, gets painted that you don't want, no big deal. Just come back with either the airbrush or hand painting and then line in those details. So the reason why this stuff all looks real nice and tight here is that's actually brush work. Just a little bit of the acrylics, this nice uh, thin brush here, like a watercolor brush. And in just a couple of minutes, I had already, um, uh, before I started the demo, I had done some brush work and I don't need to try to mask any of that off. There's no reason to try to airbrush it. Now, one of the things that we airbrushers like to do is, is we like to brag about how, how good and how tight we can airbrush something. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can airbrush the highlight on the eyeball of a fly, right? And I'm experienced enough now to, I just chuckle to myself and I say, why? <laughs> why would you do that if you're trying to put a highlight on the eye of a fly? Because it's still going to have somewhat of a soft edge to it. And there's nothing better than putting uh, an actual paintbrush on the canvas if you want something that accurate. So uh, it comes down to the best tool for the job right. uh, is what it comes down to. So um, what we'll do is let's do a little bit of shading on her. So right now I'm, I'm kind of coming into the bridge of the nose on either side of that. And I'm starting to add this soft shading of their face. Now, you know, really good tattoo artists, they can do all this kind of shading and it's going to that next level already and so uh i'm just sort of following you know kind of basic anatomy of the eyebrows and you know i want her to look kind of severe and intense and so i want the the brows to be a little furrowed and i'm achieving that look with just the the shadow coming together so now her eyebrows look like they're coming together I'm doing a little shadow underneath her hair. And so it's going to create a drop shadow and it won't look like it's cut and pasted onto her head. Like maybe it looked before. So now we're starting to wow. get, you know, really we're, we're getting that signature look of the shading yeah. and it's looking more tattooish already instead of like an ink thing. 
I don't know about the, the viewers here, but I can just watch you do this for hours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe we'll have to have an ongoing thing where we have, uh, you know, some more with Monty sessions where I come in and do some art demos. You are a master artist. It's just incredible to see you working. Thank you. Well, this is a, a lesser, you know, people aren't picking up and doing airbrushing anymore because the computer can do all this stuff. As a simulation, you can't create real art. But I, I will say, as much as I'm making this look easy to do, mm -hmm. as somebody who's been doing it for 30 years, I can tell you, unfortunately, it's not. And and sadly, a lot of people today, they just don't want to, when I tell them, you're going to have to do this for 15 or 20 years, <laughs> if you want to do it at the level that I do it. And they're like, yeah, yeah I'm out. <laughs> you know. And so that, that part can be kind of frustrating for uh, the fans are as an artist to mm -hmm. say, well, I'd love to see you carry on these traditions. And I, I just don't know what those traditions might look like years from now. It's like you see the finished uh, product that you, uh, that you put up. You just don't realize what it takes. And just like seeing you do this, you're like, oh, wow, this is a true artistry. It's mm -hmm. not just like... Uh, like you said, like everything, you're using your whole body, you're using, yep. uh, your body's an instrument. It is. Uh, well, it's actually your, in the case of airbrushing too, it's kind of your brace, right? So, and, and uh, it, it's a little bit unconscious for me just because I've been doing it for so long. Uh, but uh, I just love the fact that I, you know, or yesterday before I started this, this was a blank canvas. And so I still get a big charge out of the fact that, I'm able to do this and and say, well, okay, that there used to be nothing there, and so as an artist, that's one of the things that um, that still drives me. So when I was doing this earlier, you can see that there's no that this was done with the brush, and I could come in with the brush. Now, if I'm here and I'm feeling lazy and I don't want to break out the brush, let's see if I I have enough control on this other side to draw and indicate some like black lace, some leather stuff on the other side and not get it on her fingers. Looks like it's coming together pretty well. So sometimes, you know, even, even though I could have picked up a brush, I could have done that as well. I'm able to just softly just draw that in right there and go, oh, okay, great. Because it's also not my focal point. So even though I can come back with the, uh, the regular brush and I can highlight that stuff, um, with my brush again and bring out the cross and things like that. Uh, I'm not worried about the fact that right now it's dropping into shadow just a little bit. So right now I'm just kind of doing her, giving her these nice, you know, cheekbones. And then I'll, I need to soften her lips a little bit so that the shadows are just a little more subtle. She needs to have a little drop shadow underneath her lip. And then a little bit of a cast shadow from that finger. Now, sometimes I can refer back to if I have source material to, for something or if it's just a general front light source that I'm comfortable illustrating, then I probably don't really need to resort to um, looking back at what I call the source material, which is if you're working from a photo or you're drawing a family member or something like that. That's some more uh, things. So, uh, yeah, Ace is much I had my Halloween makeup done with airbrush. That's pretty fun. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, it's kind of cold on the skin when you're doing it. I've, I've airbrushed myself a lot for the Grinch and uh, some other costumes and stuff that I've done over the years. And Joker, who's up at 1.30 a.m., he's from the Netherlands. Oh, awesome. So this is the first time he's seeing airbrush at work, and it's mesmerizing. Oh. I agree. <laughs> cool. Uh, Nanvit here says, Monty, I love your covers. They are great. Oh, thank you. Um, that is it. I'm just amazed by this. And, uh, yeah, great. Yeah, so anyway, if you folks have any other questions or any questions at all, let, uh, let us know, type it in down here, and uh, we'll... Uh, yeah, if there's any areas, like certain things you want to see me work on, I can. Okay. Uh, so what we'll do is, is, since I've got the black in here, I'm just going to come up, yeah. and because it looks a little weird on her eyes, I'm going to go ahead and do her eyebrows and her eyelashes. And what we'll do is I'll show you the two different ways to sort of apply them. So one, you know, rather than doing separate, I'm just going to dip right into the cup. Now I can come over here and in a matter of seconds, I can just say, hey, I'm going to block in. Uh, I'm going to make sure this isn't moving. 
Uh, so let me set down the airbrush just real quick uh, so that I can fully focus because I kind of need to actually put my hand on this. Uh, and so what we'll do is, is, you know, I just call this kind of blocking in the shape of what I've done. So we put her, her, uh, eyebrow in there, a little bit of the kind of inner part of this, uh, I forgot what that little part of the eye is called. And, uh, and then I'll just kind of block that. in. now you see that only took like 10, 15 seconds. I don't have to worry about, um, uh, any overspray, anything like that. It's nice and accurate. And I'm going to go ahead and put kind of what I'll call kind of a trap line just to separate her. So you're not cheating by uh, breaking out the brush? Uh, no, no. It's all part of the process. There's It, it all works in harmony, right? Because one thing doesn't have to be an airbrush piece. It's just a piece of art. Right. Uh, year, years ago, I was probably snooty about it and been like, nah, this is all airbrush. So now I, I bet it takes me longer to do it this way, but it, it, and it might have a different look. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to do this with the airbrush. And you'll see that I don't put down the whole color at once. I have to build it up. And I'm trying to stay within the sort of guidelines that I've already drawn. Now, eventually, when I put in more white, some of that will go away. But I want to make sure that as I'm building up the white, I also don't lose my guidelines that are kind of drawn in there. So then I can kind of come in and draw the her eyelashes. Now, because the eyelashes have kind of a softer look, this would probably be a pretty good look for the, the eyelashes. And again, I will do several different layers. I can go ahead and put in a little bit of the shadow of the bridge of the nose kind of coming down here off of the off of the eye. Oh, that's neat. And then even a little bit of the sort of mascara. Usually there's a little bit of a shadow underneath the eye. Now right now this, you know, it needs a little bit of black underneath there because it looks like it's kind of like dipping down kind of too low. So sorry, my airbrush is kind of covering up where my hand is going. Wow. But even though her eyes are white, they're still eyes. So rather than just leaving this straight white, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of gray in the corner of each eye. And that should create, I'm going to test my airbrush to see if it was working right. Um, and that'll create a roundness. And it'll look more natural to drop back in there. Now, I will probably give her eyes like a glow at the end, but this is all just part of the process. And so I can do the same over here, come back, start drawing in just a little bit of the bridge of the nose. Shadow, we can add in a drop shadow that's kind of severe from her, from her hair, and that'll make the hair look like it's farther away from the face. Yep by actually adding in like a, a, a pretty serious shadow from that. Now, doesn't that look like already, yeah, well, right? Now we've got a little bit of a light source showing up. So I don't want this to be as bright white in there because it's in shadow, even though she's got white eyes. So it's just all part of the process. I'll go ahead and give her a little drop shadow to the underside. And you'll notice that even without using any hand shields, I didn't get a bunch of black over here into the hair. But even if I did, not that big a deal because I can just come in with a white stroke of a brush of white and just bring it back. Now, 20 years ago, when I was more of a beginning artist, I didn't have the confidence or the knowledge to know that, oh, why don't you put it back? I would have been meticulously trying to save that and not get any paint over it because I didn't know that I could just go and go, oh, well, that's just fine. <laughs> yeah, so I think I did stuff backwards for a really long time. Oh, so in that case, this is going to be a cover. Uh, I, you know, it just started out as an airbrush demo, but let's be honest, it really wouldn't surprise me if it didn't end up being a cover when, once it was done. So, um, we never really know what something's going to get used for, so it could. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we only got 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, Does anybody have any other questions or Any questions anything? or do you want Monty to work on any specific part? Want to see him uh, detail anything here? 
there's a lot of different ways to do different things. I can drop part of this back up here into the into the shadow. Uh, I can come in and I can just draw this. The we'll do these little skull details. Let's see. We're gonna do a little test. So why don't you come over to the side right here so you can kind of see this skull. And we're going to see how we're going to try to do a little test and see how good I can draw with this and see if I can actually draw like teeth on a skull that's basically the size of a quarter. Drum roll, please. All right, so I'm going to get it, get it going. All right, so we got four or five teeth in there. We're going to crop off the bottom because we don't need that. We need a little, little shadow there for the side of the skull. And then we need a little shadow in between the eyes right here. So furrow the brow a little bit. And then drop back the back of the skull into shadow. So admittedly, I was, you know, as I was saying, that's a lot easier to do with a paintbrush than it is an airbrush. That's just like, you know, trying to, I don't know, polish your skills or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it does have a little bit of a soft edge look. Maybe uh -huh. not the look necessarily that, you know, I would want it to have. But how much quicker is it for me to come over here and there you go and just go like this. And admittedly, you end up with a cleaner look, I think. For sure, yeah. It's, it's but if I need to soften that at all or do other things, I can, you know, I can still come in and hit it with the airbrush if I want, or I can, you know, put a little bit of shadow on it so it separates it from her cheek. So two different methods yeah, to that, approach it's a, it. It's a really cool you know, example. You can see yeah, this is a little bit out of focus. It's a little bit dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's a little more paint here than I want. But I can come back with white and I can go dunk, 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 dunk with his teeth you know, with the skull and just continue to highlight it. I can use gold paint on it. I'll probably make those gold. It's a really cool example, though, to see the two, what, what it is if you did it just straight. Right. And down here on her face, when you close up, you get a nice um, a nice look of both working together in yes. harmony of both the soft edge and the detail edge of this is what it's like when both are working well. Uh Oh yeah, does Monty have a Facebook? Yes, he does, and a social media page. So oh, yeah. it's uh, yeah, Monty so Michael Moore. Yeah, so my first name, Monty Michael Moore. Uh, you can send me a friend request. You can follow my artist page at Monty M. Moore. And then my website is uh, maverarts.com or Maverick Arts. And uh, I, I probably need to make some room on the friend request part because I think I have more friend requests right now than the 5,000 allow. So if, I, if you can't send me one right now, Try to send me one tomorrow or the next day um, because I need to delete some non-active members and go through some old profiles that aren't um, that aren't active. Uh, and I should have done that before today because I really do like to keep in touch with people who are active on Facebook and not just sort of like stalkers who don't want to talk or yeah. uh, support your art. They just you want, want social. They just want free stuff in their newsfeed. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is funny. Have you ever uh, thought the gun was blocked? Turn it around to look down the barrel and accidentally sprayed yourself in the face. Uh, probably, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done everything from ruining carpets and uh, I once drank some uh, acetone oh, when I grabbed the wrong Coke oh. and I had poured acetone oh, into it. And so that wasn't a great thing. And, and I have lots of clothes that are ruined by paint. And I dropped needles and prang things and... You know, it's just, uh, it's countless. <laughs> All right, so uh, this person says, my drawing teacher always told me if you can do eyes, uh, you can do anything you thought, what? I'm not sure what that means. Thought possible. Uh, yeah. I think uh, you know, I think it's just personal opinion. I mean, most artists will tell you drawing people is the hardest thing. But I think drawing eyes is actually one of the easier, more interesting things. And that's why even non-professional artists usually have fun drawing an eye. I wouldn't say if you can draw an eye, you can draw anything because 
I can tell you a hand is a hell of a lot harder than an eye mm -hmm. to get figures and things like that to all line up. So. Oh, we got five more minutes. What, what can you uh, show us here? What else can you do? Um, what would be so we impressive? Still have some black. So let's actually just kind of show. We're going to give the breasts some roundness. That's kind of fun. Okay, I think everyone um, <laughs> was wanted to see that, but no one wanted to say that. <laughs> so right now, all this is that you're seeing is just white on the canvas. But if I start coming in with black, and what we'll do is I'll just work on the one side, and then that will give you sort of a comparison of being able to see the comparison of, of one side to the other. And so when you're trying to create, obviously, volume on something, I don't want to get rid of the slight detail uh, that's in the actual bra, but on the same time, you, you, you don't want all the detail to be in the same perfect relief. Otherwise, uh, it won't look natural, right? So I, I don't have to worry about hiding and getting rid of stuff over here because that's not the focus, right? Focus is up here in the face, but this is all part of it. Uh, so I can also start coming in with some slightly uh, darker elements, and I can just start to start drawing in some little dark elements down here on the bottom, outside and away from where I've already indicated there's like these little... Um, you know, kind of lacy patterns and things like that. So again, all of this is part of the the process of creating the illusion of dimension, right? We're working on a flat surface and we're trying to make this look round. So as much as when everybody's in art school, nobody wants to draw spheres and circles and squares, guess what? That's all I'm doing. <laughs> you know, this is a triangle on uh -huh. top of a, a, a plane. We've got a circle. We've got a cylinder. All of these little fingers and pieces are individual cylinders that are stacked next to each other. And I hate to say it, but if you can illustrate a basketball really well, then you probably have the basic principles of a very full, voluptuous breast. Uh, because even though there are natural things that the way the human figure moves, uh, for the most part, we're working with a shape that's very similar to uh, any sort of sphere, apple, ball. And if you've done the, the practice sessions with uh, painting spheres and things like that, then you should be able to grasp the painting of light and shadow. So anyone new to this, they I guess as a new artist, you just got to focus on the basics, go back to the basics, and mm -hmm. then once Absolutely. you master that... Well, and the thing is, is everybody uh, wants to go in and draw the really fun stuff. So they're like, hey, look at my comic book art. And what, you know, a lot of times you want to say is, yeah, but did you draw circles and spheres and you try to draw an apple? And they're like, well, yeah, but that's not any fun. Of course it's not, but that's what all the really great artists did. And that's why they're, they are where they're at. But everybody wants to get right to the really cool stuff and say, oh, I want to run out and I, I want an airbrush and stuff like that. And it's like, well, did, does it warrant you spending you know, four or $500 on the equipment. If you don't know if you're going to love it, you know, see if you can try it or start out with really small stuff. Let's, I'm going to come in and I'm going to put a little bit of a shadow right underneath this um, piece of jewelry. So that's all drawn freehand, but suddenly it's starting to get a little bit of dimension. You know what, Bob Ross did all the, the landscape stuff, that's great, oh, but yeah. seeing the actual human form being transformed, <laughs> that, that's another thing. Well, and this is a lot, you know, sexier, more fun subject, but the bottom line is he was really good at what he did. Oh, he was. Right? Yeah. And he could paint some great landscapes and stuff like that, and um, uh, some of those paintings, honestly, are probably pretty valuable now, even though there was one collector who actually owns most of them. All I'm saying, we just need more... We need more, right? Monty Moore I'm, I'm doing down. this. I'm down. Live, yes. Well, and I like the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our part to, to help show the process. And I have people who watch my live streams. I have my own Facebook channel. There's how-to videos. And I want people to get interested. I want people to say, oh, I'm going to get my, my son or my daughter an airbrush or a set of colored pencils or a set of markers. And I say, start out small. You know, you don't have to buy 400 colors in the marker set. You can start out with eight. You can start out with all grays. See if they like it and then build from there. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if you stick with it, then, yeah, you can spend more and more on art supplies. But 
uh, you know, art is for everyone. And I tell everyone they should try it or at least experiment with it. Doesn't mean you have to make a living at it. Don't put your, don't give yourself the pressure that you have to show it online like we do, because if you're worried about that pressure, then you're like, oh, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as you. Yeah, well, don't, don't compare yourself to an artist that does this for 30 years, 70 <laughs> hours a week, right? Because that's probably too high a bar. And this isn't magic, what I'm doing. This isn't talent. There's a difference between talent and skill. And I don't know a single uh, successful musician or artist, honestly, that I consider or they consider talented, right? Nobody woke up and was born and could play amazing guitar or be a gold medal skier. You practice, you learn the skills. If you want to get to the NFL, you work your ass off to get what it takes to get there. That's the same thing kind of with art. If you want to make a living at it, you got to get the skills to be competitive to where you can provide for yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. And so art is for everyone. Do it at the level that you want to do it and you're comfortable with, whether it's just for you or you're willing to share it with the whole world and uh, you, you can receive accolades and you can receive criticisms and you got to be able to take the good with the bad. Awesome. Well, on that, we're going to wrap it up. Right on. And Thanks, uh, I'll make sure. Watching. To, yep, I'll make sure to put all your links in here in your description so people can find uh, find you out there in the world. Thank you, Monty Moore. Thanks, guys. We need more. Bam. Monty Moore. Sworn. Sworn.